All right. Good evening. So lesson three, here we go. Made it to, through week one to week two. Uh, remember, this is this isn't for you, this is for everybody, right? Uh, not Well, this isn't for Zach who's here. This is for everybody else who's not. Use the template. Read all the announcements. Use your username in the challenges. Literally don't use your username. Use your username. And because <laughs> we had a couple people actually type in your username. And then some people actually use your username here. Use your username. All right. Like, like mine is Z Whiten, right? Yours is probably the first part of your email address from Columbus State. Use that. That's for the challenges. Let's see, use the template, read all announcements, the naming standards inside the template, but it's also in the announcements. When you're doing group activities, critique at least two other folks' code. It's not just I like your code. Critique something about it. Uh, a lot of people last week, uh, lesson one, I didn't grade lesson two yet. I had 11 people turn in the same script. I think I have that in the announcements here somewhere. I did it in one class more than the other because, yeah. So this, don't use this stuff if you don't know what it is. If you have no idea what a dictionary is and chat GPT or the internet or, or um, Stack Overflow or GitHub gave you this, I asked you what it is. And so far, the 11 people that use this script has not told me what type of object this is. No one replied to my emails. You don't reply, you don't get points. It's that easy. If you use a complex concept not mentioned in the lessons to date, like this is number, this is lesson one, and these folks cho choose to use a dictionary, a for loop, uh, a couple for loops, and this right here. So I asked you what it was. And so far, no one told me. Uh, no one told me how it operates. If you use a concept idea, a concept that's more complex than what we cover, explain it. Because someone is going to ask you, either in the discussion board or me. You can solve all these without using anything that's not in your book. Your book is there to help you. You can solve all these riddles with everything I show you every week. It's called mastering the fundamentals. You're supposed to master the fundamentals, not baffle me with BS. It's master the fundamentals. So use the concepts that are taught to you in every lesson. I don't care if you know how to do it another way. I don't care if ChatGPT showed you how to do it another way. Master the fundamentals so you can then go on to intermediate and then professional level skill sets. All right. Got that out of the way. So let's talk about lesson three. And these are like identical. Number number underscore brownies. Come on. What's the chances of 11 of you naming the same variable, the same thing on the same damn nine number? Come on. I've been doing this too long. Quit it. You know, you're not, you're not making anybody embarrassed on yourself. It's ridiculous. Not me. Because a lot of my students went and moved on to go work at Specter Ops, the DOD, um, nationwide, a lot of things local. You're not hurting my feelings. You know, pick it up. Pick it up. Literally, you you sign up for this class. You want to be an IT professional. I hope some of you end up in my lab or in, in my area with, with uh, doing cybersecurity with me. I need good people. Pick it up. Learn the basics. Do good things. Kick a whole bunch of digital butt. That's what you're here for. Kick a digital butt, right? So, of course, lessons. Made it through if and else statements. Super important. You're going to use those all the time. And guess what else you're going to use all the time? Some type of loop. I do not use while loops that often. Why? I'll tell you why when we get there. So, while for calculator running total is basically adding one to a variable for every time you iterate through it or loop. Iterate is a fancy word for loop. Iteration, go through, right? Enumerate, go through a list. Um, when you write a list to go to the grocery store, you need onions, you buy them, you put them in your cart, you scratch it off. You're enumerating through your list until you're done. That's it. Uh, input validation. That's uh, what type. Um, did they enter? Um, if they didn't enter an integer and you catch this error, ask them again. Ask them to put input again, right? 
think of websites when you uh, type in your phone number incorrectly, or if you put like a dash in the phone number and it didn't want the dash, it just wanted the 10 digits, it'll prompt you again. Can you re enter your phone number the correct way? Well, they didn't tell you the correct way to begin with, but anyway, it's a different story, right? Guide your users is another pro tip. Stop just writing code that says, how many brownies do you want? Welcome people. It costs nothing to do a print statement. Hello, welcome to the brownie, Python brownie calculator. You'll be asked for a number of brownies to make. How many brownies would you like? Guide the user. The better you get with guiding the user now, it'll become second nature when you need a port number, host name, IP address, something of that nature from a user to complete a task. Right? Start thinking that way. Let's kick it off. Let's, let's talk about some topics first. Let's talk about some concepts here. So let's just talk about what, what the construct of a for loop and a while loop. It's literally this for a for loop. For iterating variable in some type of sequence, followed by a colon, tab over, do something. So what does that really mean? That really means for each item in my group of items, Do this. That's it. This is the, what's stated in your book. This is pretty conceptually pretty standard. For each item in my list of items, perform this task. Pretty common. Now the while loop. While this expression is met, perform these statements. And that's a nested one. We'll get rid of this for now. While this expression is met to perform these statements, let me put this into framework for you, right? Would you like to play a game? Yes. While the user wants to play the game, run the game. During the game, if you choose to quit, it'll break that. So you could do some, something like play equals input. Now this is just a pseudo code. It's not going to be real, but you could turn it into real code if you want. Input, uh, would you like to play a game? How about global thermonuclear war? Anybody know what that's from? <laughs> would you like to play a game? Question mark. Right. Now, give them the choice of uh, yes or no. Right. Then right here, you can start using your fun stuff. Can we see your screen? You know, that would be great if I was sharing. Man, good one. See, man? So thinking, I'm thinking, I'm sharing all the time. I'm typing away. Good call out, by the way, Zach. Everybody see it? That's what happens when you, you don't. I'm weaning myself off of caffeine. I'm not thinking even less straight. Cool, excellent. So let me go over that one, one more time real quick. For each item in my group of items, do this. It's basically saying for iterating variable in my sequence, perform this. This and this, right? Pretty much identical. While loop, while some expression is met, you're going to perform these script statements. And this is some pseudocode for that right now. Play equals, would you like to play a game? Yes or no. And you can say, while play, is equal to yes, do this, whatever this is. And then you could ask them play equals uh, input. Do you wish to continue? Question mark. Continue question mark. Yes slash no. And here, if they hit no, play will be no. So then the loop would break. You'll see sloppy coders do things like this. Break. <laughs> Sometimes it's okay to use break. Sloppy coders use break. Now, break is a command. It breaks you out of the loop. I get that. But if you could logically break out of your loop, use logic. 
it gives you more control. It gives you and the user more control over your code, right? Just think about that. So what happens here is this goes play input. Would you like to play a game? I enter yes. While play, why yes, why y equals y, do whatever this, whatever you want to do. And when you're done playing it, ask them again, do you wish to continue, yes or no? Well, if they hit no, play equals no, while no equals yes, break, it goes down to here. It, it keeps going. Like, it'll keep going throughout your code. It'll break out of the loop. And we'll see some examples coming up. <clears throat> There's also something called range. Range is a command that, a function, that was designed to work with for loops. For loops are designed to iterate through a sequence, some type of list, some type of um, group of objects. A range happens to be just that. A range could be a list of a length of integers, integer, or it could be just a list of integers, or it could be a set of integers. <clears throat> so what does that really mean? Right. So range, you can pass between one and three integer arguments. A range, when you go to use it, the command looks like this. Range, your start, I want to start at 0. I want to stop at 11, because that'll give me 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And I want to count by 2. This is your start, where you're going to stop, and step. So here, it would actually start off at, well, let's see. Let's go ahead and run it, right? Let's do var1 equals range. Call my var1. You, you notice it says it exactly? Cool. For each item in my var1, print var1. Oh, well, it's not iterating. Why did it do that? Why why did it do that? Why did it do the range thing? Anybody know? Don't worry, we're gonna talk about well, so we got some coming in. Boop. Sweet. So with range, let's do a help on range. Always important if you don't know command, do a help on it first. Ninety one lines. The class, it's a range object. Default with one is a stop, start, stop, step. If you add all three variables, returns an object that produces a sequence of integers. That's good. All right, for each item in my variable, print, print, print. Well, that's all nice and good. Well, it says range. Hmm, how do I get it to iterate through it, though? For each item in my range, start, start at 0, stop at 11, count by 2. It's perfect. Zero, two, four, six, eight, ten. 2, 4, 6, It worked out perfect. For each item in my range, start at 0, stop at 11. That means it'll stop at 10, oh, right? It stops one before your integer. So here you have, for 0 in my range of 0, starting at 0, stopping at 11, stepping by 2. So basically counting by 2 from 0. Two or zero, two, four, six, eight, ten. Awesome. We'll work more with that when we go to for loops. But a range allows you to on the fly build a length of how many times your your for loop is going to iterate. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about lists here. They're not mentioned in this chapter. Learning isn't linear. You could read forward about lists if you want, but I'm going to show you everything you need to be successful here. A list is nothing more than an object of objects. 
well, what does that really mean? You can use a list by creating, we'll take, start a variable ML, my list equals list, open, close, hit enter. If I do a type on ML, this is a way to make an empty list. You see that it's a list object. When you call an ML directly, it's empty. List service square brackets. It's empty. Okay. Well, you could also create an empty list by just doing this. Open, close square brackets, call it ML. You still get an empty list. Two different ways to create empty list. Well, what if you wanted to fill your list? Well, we're not going to get into the methods of a list. That's for a later date, but I'll show you how to build a list. My list equals square bracket, one comma, two comma, three comma, A comma, T. That's good enough. And when I call it ML, it has my list. There's something called length of my list. It'll tell you you have five objects. They're in indices. One is in zero, two is in one, three is in two. You guessed it. So it's zero, one, two, three, four. Zero, one, two, three, four is five. The length is five. We'll learn more about lists, I think, in chapter lesson five. But for right now, you could use them in its basic infancy, as I'm showing you now, if you want, because you could use them in loops, like for each item, item, just a variable name in my list, print, let's just print the item. So now it said for one in my list, print one, for two in my list, print two, for three in my list, print three, for A, print A, for T, print T, Done with objects in my list, the for loop quit, you're back to the shell. That's how a loop, a for loop works. It'll iterate through how many number of objects you have and then stop. I suggest when you work with larger data sets, for loops for less than 100,000 objects work awesome. If you're doing something plus 100,000 objects, you might want to look into doing different things. We'll talk about that. Uh, probably less than six. But uh, Python could do about 10 million string comparisons a second. And that's not using a GPU. That's using your common like CPUs, your 64-bit processors nowadays. Um, and people still say it's slow. And it is compared to other languages. But it's fast enough to where most humans use it and they're satisfied. Biologists, electricians, engineers, computer cybersecurity folks were satisfied with the speed of Python without learning any other complex language. Does that make sense? And then you have nested for loops. So you, just like nested if-else statements, you could nest your for loops. For each item in my what's considered the outer loop or parent loop, perform this. And then do this for this object. And then when you're then when this is finished, it'll go back to the parent loop and create do the child loop again, parent loop, child loop, parent loop, child loop, parent loop, child loop, until you're done with objects. Kind of cool. Now this is just an overview. I'm gonna go into each of these pretty in depth now, but we're gonna focus on while loops, for loops, ranges, lists, a little bit of lists, and uh, that's about it. Any questions before we move on? Cool, let's beat up range. Perfect. We run this. Okay. Let me get rid of this and start a new one. All right. So let's talk about this. Here's a variable, a range, equals range stopping at five. When you use just one variable or one parameter for the range function, it's stop. We proved that with getting help on range earlier. So here we said print 
just the variable, a range. And then you get your range of zero through five. Now, when you ask for a list of your variable of a range, you will see that it shows you each individual integer. And if you use the function of length on your variable of range, it tells you that there's five items in it, which is true. Zero through four are five items. So what good is this? Well, if you didn't have, say if your boss just gives you a CSV file, a list of host names, he didn't count them, he or she didn't count them, you didn't count them, you just import them into a, a list, and you just, you call it host names, list host names. If you run length on list host names, it'll tell you the length. You have 42 devices. Awesome. You could put those in a range by doing length of my list inside of a range. Unnecessary. You'll see a lot of people do that online. In my opinion, it's unnecessary because a for loop will only iterate through as many objects are in that list. So there's no use to do, there's no good reason to perform a range on that list unless you wanted to gain more control. Unless you only wanted to do every third item, that's when your step comes into place. That's when you can say start at zero, go to the length of my list, and then step by three. So then every third item in your list, you'll perform whatever app, uh, whatever action is in your for loop. If you want to do everything, don't use range in a list with length. If you want to be picky and add more control, then you can start using length and range and start and stop and all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, there's a reason, let's say you're a cybersecurity specialist, you're a pen tester, you're given a scope of uh, three subnets, to, uh, 256, 250 slash 255 for all of them. So, you know, 255 times three, that's so many things, 256 times three, that's so many hosts you could have, but you don't want to do them all. Y your, your job is only to do like 5%. So could you do a range on all those that count and do every like sixth or seventh machine or attempt to? Yeah, that's where range comes in. It'll help you out to shorten your list or or shoot at a, a large count of something, but take a, a snippet of each one. You didn't necessarily don't have to hit every one. You could, you know, take a take a sample, if you will. So that's range in a nutshell. Range was designed for four. It really was. So here we have our host names, Dell One. Host and two, 45, and Lenny. And now we're going to do length of devices. So this should give us one, two, three, four, right? And now here's the example I just talked about. Uh, for range of our list of devices, we're going to have range starting at one, going the entire length of the list, but counting by two. So in theory, you should always sample two devices. For each item, print item. Let's see if we're correct here. Yep, one and three. So it would use this guy, host and two, and Lenny, because they're sitting in indices zero, one, two, and three. Bit complex, but it makes sense. Range allows you that granularity. Now, if you didn't want to, use this, you can simply probably use this, LD, right? Save, run. Oh, what happened? <clears throat> what happened here? Line 12 for item in LD, integer object is not iterable. Well, length of device only gives me an integer can't iterate through a single number. Doesn't make any sense. 
Well, what if we gave it the list itself? Because the list itself is made up of objects, just like a range. There we go. Now we're saying for each item in my list of items, for Dell 1 in devices, print Dell 1. For host and 2, print host and 2. For 45, print 45. For Lenny, print Lenny. You're done. So you can use the list in a for loop. And it'll iterate through each object in the list. Extremely helpful. Cool. So you can do it numerically with a range by controlling it with a set, or you can feed it a direct list. Sweet. All right, change this back. Any questions on that example? Cool, let's rip it. So here we go. Range for I, execute I times print. So we have a range of stopping at five, zero through four. That's five objects. For zero in range, print zero. For uh, one in range, print one, two, print two, three, four, print four, then you're done. And then I printed a, an empty line here, which is right here. Awesome. Right. If you want to do something a certain amount of times to the same object, not sure why. Well, it might be offline. So you might say range of XYZ performed this many times, you know, attempted to log onto this machine this many times and failed. You do all kinds of fun stuff with range. Let's keep going. Let's take a look at this one. So this is like slicing a range. Um, I think we really need to do this. Yeah, it's mastering a range. Why not? So right here, you could stop at 10, and you go 0 through 9. Here, you could start at 10 and stop at 16, which would give you 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Here, you could start at 10, stop at negative 10, and count backwards by negative one. Okay. Why would you ever want to do this? Five, four, three, two, one blast off countdowns. You could do all kinds of fun stuff with this. Now from 10 going to negative, stopping at negative 10, your last one is negative nine. But it does hit zero, negative 10 to negative, or to 10 to 1 is 10, 0 is 11, negative 1 to negative 9 is 9, 9 plus the 0 for 1 plus your 10 is 20. So that's a way to count through 20, right? And starting at 10, which looks kind of cool, right? And we can prove that by going back up here. Let's just grab this. And we'll put this right here. Let's see what I want here. Let's see how this looks. So exactly like I said, start at 10, stop at negative 10. It did, it stopped at negative, last one's negative nine, because it stopped at negative 10. Count backwards, negative one. Negative one, negative one, 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 one. Cool, right? Let's do something a little bit more cooler. Let's, let's start at 5. Well, we'll just start at 10. We'll stop at negative 1. And now you have your 10 countdown. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Right? And now, if you wanted to add some logic to here, you could add an if statement. It says, if... Ah, let's just do it. Right? You could say... Uh, do, 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 let me see... You could say, um, if I is equal to zero, print, and simply say blast off, right? And we'll do uh, an else, print I. Think this will work? Uh-oh, what I do? commas, or dreaded uh, quotes, right? 
Oh no, what happened again? Inconsistent use. So now we, we're using logic from lesson two in lesson three. So now we have a for loop for each integer in my range, starting at 10, stopping at negative one, counting backwards by negative one. If by integer is equal to zero, print blast off, else print an integer. So we have 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, blast off. Cool, right? It's a fun one. And now let's take a look at this last piece right here for four loops. Let's see, this one right here, I'll remove that. So now we have a list. We have ML, my list, equals all these different things, different objects inside my list object. For each item in my list, if item not equal to Tim, print the item. Hmm, that's cool. Say if you had a couple host names that you knew were offline, you could say, if item not equal to this host name or not equal to this host name. So you can skip those by adding logic. It's helpful, right? So here we have for A in my list, print A. For B, for one. Uh, for Tim, not equal to Tim. Well, guess what? It is equal to Tim, so it's not going to print it. And then Liam prints Liam. Cool. A lot of different things you can do with for loops. How do you feel about them so far? I know this is like a really fast introduction to them, but it's a fast class. I love for loops. I can't remember the last time I wrote a, any code without a for loop. No joke. At least one for loop. Because I... In cybersecurity, I always have a list of things that I'm looking for, indicators of compromise, stuff like that, host names, IPs, ports, um, URLs, uh, file names, file hashes, you name it, right? Dates. Uh, and once you get these lists, you could basically do anything. Because if you meet the criteria of an item, and your logic is sound, you could ask for whatever you want. Yep, AB1 Liam, you got it. You could do all kinds of fun stuff. So, no questions on for loops. We'll move to covered range, covered for loops. Do, 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 do. There's more for loop stuff, but that's a more fun one with range. I will do this one too. This one is more for in loop in a range. Um, also covers a counter on how to add add to a counter, so that's cool. We'll rip through these pretty quick. Not because I'm in a hurry, just because we got a lot a lot to cover. Whoop. All right. So if we just use range on its own with a stop, you're going to hear me repeat myself a lot because that's how we learn, right? For each element in my range stopping at five, so zero through four, print the element end with, with, end with a space. I change the default ending of print to a space instead of a hard return. So it prints all on one line. Now, if I remove this end, the default for print is indeed a new space, so it prints them out vertically. This may have something to do with a, a lab you have to do coming up. Just letting you know. All right? So remember end and remember sep. Those are your two best friends here. So cool. Range worked for each element in my range. Print the element. Perfect. Not mad about this. Let's take a look at this one. Now, I'm starting at 1, stopping at 6. So the numbers should change from 0 through 4 to 1 through 5. They sure do. Awesome. 
Now here's like a countdown like we we're doing earlier. Start starting at five, stopping at negative one. So it'll go five to zero, counting backwards by negative one. Awesome. Right? Working as designed. Well, guess what? Strings are a list of strings. So a character on its own is a string. A word was nothing more than a list of strings put together. So you could do things like for each item in, in string or for each character in string, print the character ending with the space. So now you'll have that. If you remove this, it'll print them vertically, right? So you don't have to do a list on a string because a string, you could it's an object that you could already iterate through. You could iterate through a string. So what does that mean? You could add it to a for loop and you could say for each item in my string, print each item, which would break it down by per character, which we just did. Cool. It's another handy thing with for loops, right? It also works with uh, tuples, tuples, if you're from Britain. They're like lists, except they're immutable. We'll talk about them more in a later lesson. For each item in my tuple, print the tuple, save a five. It operates just like a list. We're not going to get into those right now. We'll talk more about them later on. And now, this gets fun. This is going to be the last one for this. So this, I set a variable counter to zero. I say for each value in my list, and I've given it three words from a very famous Ramon song, hey, ho, let's go. Now for each value in my list, it's going to add one to the counter. That's just like writing. This is the more Pythonic way of writing counter equals counter plus one. Because it would be zero plus one, one plus one, two plus one, then that number would be stored in here. This is a more Pythonic way of writing the same thing I just wrote right here. I'm just going to comment that out. And then I'm going to have to print the value. And then what's done, hey, ho, let's go. It's going to print the counter which should not be zero anymore. Hey, ho, let's go. Counter, three. Awesome. Simple as that. For every iteration, you add one to your counter. That's how you do a counter. Does that make sense? But you notice it's in the loop. If I add this outside the loop, If I put this outside of the loop and run it, it only happens one time. Perform as the loop, prints the value, add one to my counter, prints counter plus one. That's it. To change the value of your counter, the counter has to be within the for loop or the while loop, either way, right? And this is uh, going into dictionary. We'll come back to that at a different time when we talk about dictionaries in lesson five. They're a pretty complex object for right now. So I was really surprised to see a week one. But this is uh, this is it for four loops in a range. It's not too bad. Once you, once you start working with them, you have to give it that effort. You have to work with it, right? Just remember that. Like, don't give up on them right away. Like, oh, man, I don't, you know, this is garbage. Give them some time. Now let's check out while loops. What are the difference between a while loop and a for loop? Anybody have an idea? Anybody? Okay, so let me tell you. If I were to tell you, do push-ups. For each push-up, while I have enter, or for each push up in my push ups, I'm going to do one until I'm done with an energy or, or done with my energy. 
right? You're going to sit there and you're just going to knock out as many as you can. And you're going to be like, oh, man, 58, I'm done. Ugh. Could you write a for loop or a while loop for that? While loop makes more sense. While I have energy, do push-ups. Now, if I said do 50 push-ups, for each push-up in my list of fit or my number of 50 push-ups, do one push-up. Remove one. For each push-up in my list of 49, 48, 47, 46, when you get to zero, you're done. You stand up. If you know the number or have a range or you know how many objects you have, use a for loop. If you don't, like measuring energy, use a while loop where energy could be different for anybody. While loop use a Boolean and, and checking uh, at last. Uh, yeah, you can. You can use a Boolean. You'll see while true everywhere. And I hate that. That's total junk. While true. Guess what? It's always true. And that's why you see those crappy programmers also use break. They'll write things like this, which you'll never see me write because it's trash. You'll see right at the gate, they go while true. And then they'll do something. Do a whole bunch of stuff, and then they'll just say, break, when they're done. So let me ask you a question. If they had to run this anyway, did they need this? And did they need this? And could they have just wrote their code anyway? Because they have to run it anyway? <laughs> While what? While true. Now, if you, exactly. Now, if you write something like, uh, like I showed you earlier, would you like to play? Like play equals yes or no? and input and you know just say uh would you like to play question mark enter a yes or no and then after this you say while play not equals is is equal to while play is equal to yes you know then perform all this and then right down here, ask them again if they want to play. And then if it's no, it'll break. Or you could say, while wow, play, yes or no. And then you could have underneath it, you could put play uh, equals um, if play. You could do it if, you could do it if right here. Hold on. You could do, if play is equal to y, then play equals true if you really wanted to keep your true or false right but then you could just put while while play equal to true if you want to keep that boolean um, motif going that'll work fine certain languages newer languages don't even have while loops because they realize that you write the code anyway Usually, an if statement has to be right for you to trigger something. So, just write better code, right? A lot of whiles could be completely removed, uh, in my opinion. But not to confuse you, right? Because here, we're going to do things like set a counter equal to three. Now, while is going to test an expression. While that expression is met, it's going to perform these tasks. Counter equal to three. Go to this. So now we have while counter greater than zero, countdown, type the counter or print the counter, remove one from your counter. So now it's, it never goes to counter three again. While three greater than zero, print counting down three. Remove one, two. While two greater than, print two. Remove one. While one greater than, while zero, done. We'll prove it. Doesn't print zero because while zero greater than zero, false. That's that Boolean that uh, Tadius was talking about. Tadios, Tadios, TD. What do you want to be called, buddy? You're the one that who came in uh, Desta. Or what, what do you want? What do you What do you want your name to be, man? It could be anything. 
But that's that Boolean you mentioned, right? While this expression is met, the minute that this is false, your loop breaks. It's perfect. Right? Let's move right along here. So this will never execute. Why? Nothing happens. Well, zero. Zero is never greater than zero. So this never executes. All right, cool example. Logically, it's sound. Right? Now, here comes your break. Causes it to exit. Counter equals zero. While one, while one is just like writing while true. You'll learn that in your reading. Zero is saying false. One is true. You could do things like um, one is equal to true. True. Zero is equal to false. True. Zero is false and one is true. That's why they're both true. Does that make sense? It's a Boolean logic for you, right? So while true, print executes at least once. If not, counter break. What's going to happen here? Yep, not zero. You got it. Equal to true. It's equal to. You could do it. Let's try that. Not zero is equal to. Does this work? True? Now, true has to be capitalized. That's true. So you could say zero not equal to true, and that's true. A couple different ways you could do it. Cool tip. Boolean is really cool. It'll help you out in a pinch if you need to make a true or false call or a yes or no call and just use true or false in its place. We'll, we'll go through some of those. But this only execute once because it literally hits if not counter break, bust out of the loop, you're out of here, right? How could we change this to do a never-ending loop? I could do, I'm going to do one I don't really want to, but I will. I'll do, um, I'll just do this while true. Print test. And this is what I mean about a never-ending loop. It'll constantly keep going until your memories fill up and crash your computer. Hit Control C and hope you catch it in time to break it. Uh, you do not want to test never-ending loops on a production server. Not to self, right? But that will keep going forever. Let's see what we got here. Doot, 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 doot. And this is uh, got a list of names. While names, print the name. Now, this is more advanced because we're getting to methods of a list object. And the method we're using is pop. Pop removes the last item of a list. So this says, while names, names will be true as long as it has an item in it. And then print names pop without an argument will grab the last item in the list and print it because it'll grab that you're basically saying names pop which grabs this which you get right here and it removes it from the list and then it'll say while names true print names pop print that one now names is empty so while names false then it breaks the loop that's another way to leverage a while loop a little bit tricky a lot of room for error. I often don't use that, but you can. What else we got? This is kind of an inner outer function. This is kind of fun, uh, inner outer type thing. So this is uh, testing if you're true or false, zero, one, zero, processed, pass. These are different counters. That's all they are. Simply setting a variable to zero and then changing it either positive or negative if some condition is met. So in theory, we should process three and only a few should pass, depending on if you're looking for a certain value. 
Oh, now what I do? Multiple quotes down here. So now we have three process, two past. That's it. This is a bit more complex because we're using a list. We're using the pop method for the list object, and we're altering some empty counters, process, and past. But is there also a push? No. Not that I know of for lists. There's an append, an add, and something else. There's quite a few, but there is not a push to at least for a list object. Web objects, yes. Now, while we look at this, these are nothing more than counters. And we're adjusting them however we want. Could you, if you had a list of usernames, literally do users processed, users failed. If the password change was successful, user pat user process plus one else user failed plus one so you could write counters in your code as of outcome of performing a task that's cool too right so else we got we beat up range we beat up four beat up while i'm happy with that i'm pretty happy with that it's a lot of information in a short amount of time we discussed lists Feel free to use them. Um, the more you use lists, the better you get with them. And uh, I'll be honest, 90, 90 plus percent of the code I write has a for loop, some type of list object, and then if else statements or like logic. That's pretty common. Because you want to perform some task on a lot of things at once. And then when you're done, you're done. That's what a lot of system admins do for each update in my list of updates. If the machine is a Windows 11, push this update. If it's a Windows 10, push this. If it's a server, push this. You could write all kinds of code. And especially with like Ansible and stuff like that, you can even get even trickier. You can get, you can get as tricky as you want nowadays, which is a lot of fun. Let's see what else I got up my sleeve for you. It's about it. Let me check out the group activities. Group activities. The first one's kind of easy. The, the bird is playing fetch. The second one, you have to iterate through the length or the range of how many spaces there are, not how many hashtags, which usually messes people up. Because remember, a space is a thing right here. So you can just print that, right? Use a for loop and then another for loop, then another print statement. So four print statements, two for loops. Any idea how, you, how, how we crush this? Any thoughts? Nothing? Nobody? Do, 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 do. I got a couple. I'm trying to find a decent one. Do, 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 do. Let me see that one. Yeah, we'll do it. We'll do um we'll do this one. This one gives most people a problem. So you want to draw this joker right here, which after 20 some years of getting paid to do IT, I've never been asked to draw anything out of an interview in Python. <laughs> and I'm glad because I probably could draw that well with Python. But this isn't about that. This is about finagling. Let's see, I got so many versions. Let's try this one. Yeah, I like this. This is cool. We'll do this from scratch, right? So you'll use the template. We'll open a new file. Let me grab it. Draw it over here, right? So what do we have here? We have go grab it, gather your requirements. I'll just snake this. 
We need to make something that looks like that. Well, the first thing I'm going to do is just do print. We'll just start with this, right? Cool. That's the beginning. And this is also the end, right? Single. We may change this if our code changes, right? Now, it's about the number of spaces. Now, if you have something and you print this space or this this hashtag and this hashtag, and then manipulate the distance between them. That's the goal here, right? So you have a variable, I'll call it spaces. And I'll have it literally equal a space because we're going to do math on this. Remember, you could do things like, uh, let me run this. Uh, save. Yeah, called test. It's fine. Ah, oh, there's already a test. Test that. That's good. Oh, run it. You could already do things like times 10. Well, there's my 10 spaces. So you could do math on a space. So we're going to focus on what we know by using a range. And that's like zero, one, two, three, four. Okay, so we'll use that. Hmm. Well, let's think of that. Zero stopping at five. So our range would be zero stopping at five. So you could literally say, Four. Let's say number of spaces in range zero, stopping at five, right? And counting by one. That's fine. Now, here you're going to print, and it's going to be your first. Uh, hashtag, right? A comma. And then it's going to be your number of spaces times the actual spaces itself. Because you're going to multiply how many spaces you have. Or you can flip-flop it if it makes it easier for you. And here's your last one. Right now, let's see how this looks. Okay, we're getting there, but you notice there's double the spaces. That's because the default separator in print puts a space between each object, and here we have three objects, so we have to change sep to equal nothing. And now you can see the difference. This is the last one. This is the first one. Well, then we just grab this code, print that, flip this around. We're going to start at, uh, let's do four, I think. And we'll go to zero. So we need a negative one. And we're counting backwards, so negative one. Kind of like it. One of these is broken. I'll take this to a four. Ah, that looks pretty darn perfect. Now, let's remove this bottom one. Because another way to print this bottom one would be able to say four number, number of spaces in range. And this is starting at one, stopping at zero, counting by negative one, which would be itself. Print the pound sign. If I could, or the uh, hashtag Octothorpe. And now we get the same thing. So this is the equivalent to this. 
Which one would you rather use? Up to you. Could you do it differently? Could you do it all in ranges? Well, no, because you need to get this one by itself. Now, could you do a nested for loop? Like, could you do this? Give ourselves a little room so we could read this. Yep, Python will draw it. I drew my extra one up here, right? So there we go. Not bad. You have a number of characters to throw until you hit the middle, or maybe something kind of with the line you're on. But yep, 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 yep. yep you're right. You could, you could totally do that if you knew the line count, right? Which is basically almost the same as spaces, but yeah, it would be darn similar. But this is how you manipulate a space. And why? Because we defined a space as a space. And remember, a space is an object. Let's 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 just do var one var one down here equals an actual space. And when we do a type on var one, we get a string. It is an object. If there's a global command to make sep equal for all prints without having to type it out every time, no, no, there's not. Um, I'm sure you could mess with the comp file, a configuration file within Python to make a change, be a different default, but that's uh, probably in an advanced, I teach that in advanced level. I wouldn't teach that here because when you start messing with your Python comp files, um, bad things happen. There's a lot of dependencies on core uh, functions. Python actually uses itself to complete a lot of technical tasks. So. But yeah, there could be. I know in um, different programs that use Python, like Splunk and like Elastic, you can set different global variables like that and comp files and change them. But this is cool stuff. And uh, let's see, for, for the other one, you'll do another range too. Range of hours played or time played with the dog, but this, this will be good enough. I'll dump this in chat so everybody could have it. And that's about it for this evening. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.